Hello, and welcome to the Inside of East podcast for March the 4th, 2022. This is episode 100. And (laughs) (laughs) somebody could lose an eye like that. So, on today's show, we'll be talking about the Polestar O2 concept, the electric baby Jeep crossover coming in 2023, and Ford has created a Model E division for its electric vehicles. I'm Don Manicchioni, Inside EV's forum moderator and Inside EV's editor. Joining us today is the spectacular Tom Malogny, Inside EV's editor and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. We also have the mastermind, Mr. Martin Lee, from the recently revamped EV News Daily Podcast, which is available on all the best podcast platforms. And of course, Kyle Connor joins us from the majestic, practically palatial halls of Out of Spec Studios from where they produce videos for a number of YouTube channels. Okay, so before we get going, I'd like to ask that you please subscribe to this channel. Uh, If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button and ring that bell icon for notifications. And if you're watching us on Twitch, you can ring that bell icon for notifications. Um, All right, so with that out of the way, welcome everybody. Happy 100. Happy 100. (laughs) Happy, happy. I think I'm the only one. We did it. We got there, guys. Things. So actually, I'd like to thank all our, our, our audience, our listeners, our viewers, all of you, because you know it's really you all that make the show, because we wouldn't be here <laughs> if you weren't here. Uh, so I wasn't so a... prepared to have any bubbles, so I have some really lovely green thing <laughs> with, <laughs> with matcha and flax and added vitamins because why i could be drinking booze it's that's... friday afternoon for me it's almost friday evening it's certainly past midday that's allowed <laughs> martin <laughs> that's like the most electric car podcast drink <laughs> on the planet <laughs> that's, that's the old old school electric car podcast now we're, you know things are moving along we're, yeah, we're taking over we're... General swaths of the population who, yeah, and drinking oh fizz first thing in the morning. That's yeah. what we're doing these days. To, we drank everything in the office. Genuinely, I showed up <laughs> and there was nothing left. <laughs> I love it. All right, so I'm gonna have a sip of this mimosa. I'm gonna give this a miss. Whoa, <laughs> it's been a while since I had one of those. Okay, so, <laughs> um. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Tom, are you not drinking anything? I'm just doing the coffee. I, I wasn't up. I wasn't up for the alcohol right now today. I'm not feeling that great, but uh, um, I'll I'll celebrate with the Joe. So, it, um, Tom just had his, his booster shot, so he's a little bit under under the weather. Um, I even though he, he had the first two booster shots, he got through. I guess all right. Oh, there you go. MX30. Yeah, it's oh, a really yeah. slow mug. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That won't get you very far. No. Um, <laughs> so, that was a joke. Okay, so let's kick it off with our comment of the week, or Katwa for short. So last week, uh, Vitaly Levin commented, Jordan, if you're being held against your will, blink twice. So, <laughs> right. So there's a message on the screen if you're watching this on YouTube. Poor guy couldn't get a word. For- Maybe yeah. for our new audience uh, or who or are just tuning in, Jordan's one of my colleagues at Out of Spec, and occasionally he'll join on the podcast. He loves electric cars. He's actually in the comments now, so everyone say, hey, Jordan, in the comments. But um, the, the answer is Jordan is always being held against his will when he's in the office. Everyone <laughs> here is. <laughs> right on. So uh, speaking of Jordan, I, I recorded a, uh, an episode of the Out of, Out of Spec podcast with him and Kyle a couple days ago, and it was fun. We tried playing a little guitar together, and we chipped and sipped, chatted and sipped on some adult beverages. So I, I don't know when that Kyle is going up, uh, or maybe Monday. ever. <laughs> but when? Yeah, Monday it goes up. Okay. So where can people catch the Out of Spec podcast? On all your favorite podcast platforms or on YouTube, of course, Out of Spec Podcast. But we have a big listenership. So just Apple Podcast, Google uh, is where most people listen to us. That's right. Awesome. So uh, let's talk about what we've been driving this week. So, Kyle, uh, you've had the um, Mercedes EQS 450 Plus and you've given it a range test and you live streamed it yesterday. So, and your video was like six hours and 40 some minutes long. So how far does six hours and 40 minutes or so get you? 
Yeah, well, I, the live stream I filmed sort of the pre-process through the right. whole thing, and I and I have not live streamed up until recently, but I I did it the other day when I did a battery degradation test on my Model Three. It's just hit one hundred thousand miles, so we're running it through a series of tests. And actually, right after this podcast, we're going to go drag race that car against a brand new Tesla Model Three performance and see how much slower it is with the mileage. So that'll be really interesting to see. Um, but the EQS, you know, was the second live stream and it was so much fun. So I decided to say, hey, I'll show everyone how I get the car set up, you know, put the air in the tires, went to go warm the battery up, did the whole thing. And the car uh, did 300. I actually have to look. It was the longest range I've ever tested. Now, we all know Tom has done 500 miles on the nose in the lucid air, which is a true impressive feat, not only for the car, but also for a human to drive that long, uh, sort of consistently with only one brake. And the EQS, I don't actually have the data in front of me. Someone will have to comment how far it went. It was like 344 miles, something like that. Okay. Yeah, I'm plus or minus. It. I thought I had a picture of it, but I don't. Yeah, it was like 344-ish point yeah. something. 344. Well, yeah. the, the screenshot you sent me was 344. Yeah. And what was what was the watt hour per mile on that? Three something. Three, 315 super efficient this is a heavy yeah. car thing weighs like 5500 pounds mm -hmm. and it was on the big wheels and it was on snow tires mm -hmm. and look at you'll actually see this right here on this video if you're watching it can make a u-turn basically standing in place because of rear steer which is just amazing yeah. it's a great wow. long distance car i didn't use the seat massagers or anything because that's not i mean we saved 50 feet by not using the seat <laughs> massagers. But Tom and I, we never run climate control on the seat or massagers. It's just one way to control another variable. And it was the quietest and most comfortable range test that I could have done another 300 miles easily right after this drive. It was very nice. And the 315 watt hour um, uh, consumption rate is um, 3.17 miles per kilowatt hour for, for those that want to translate it, which is astounding for a car that big that luxurious in with winter tires and did you mention the temperature kyle i i don't know if we, oh yeah know. it was perfect conditions yesterday pretty much we were between 60 and 70 degrees fahrenheit okay. and very little wind you can see the flag over there backing in there's no wind right there so we had a bit of a crosswind and a cold spike for a few minutes going into nebraska but i quickly turned around and went back the other way and so it was about as good as you could expect considering the snow tires and the big wheels. Um, I, I was really impressed with the range. So so the way I look at this is this car would easily do 355, 360 miles, potentially more if it was equipped with the aero wheels and the summer uh, range optimized tires. Well, that's, that's pretty good numbers. That's nice. Yeah, so I, I'm thinking high 300s is where EQS rear-wheel drive would come in you know, with the proper wheel and tire setup. Wow. Nice. That's, uh, that's kind of where we want to be. Actually, I think, you know, close yeah. to close to 400 miles. Like, yeah. I and think... I guess the, the impressive part to me is like, of course, Lucid went a lot farther and, and probably had better efficiency, much better efficiency, but the Germans have never been efficiency Kings. And uh, this is like the first time we can say this is a big, luxurious, you know, filled with everything it has a lot more content in it than a Lucid air. I mean, a lot more content in it. And uh, in terms of modules and control stuff, and it's got a six phase rear motor. I mean, it's, it's really packed full of stuff and sound deadening and it was pretty efficient. That's impressive from the Germans. Nice. Oh, just thank you everyone for all these comments. This, this is great on the congratulations <laughs> and everything. I'm really appreciating this watching this go by. I can't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I tell you, it's something that we hit a hundred, you know, and, uh, not to sidetrack too much, but you know, yeah. I want to thank that my uh, podcast team here, the, the three of you guys have been fantastic and has made it fun to do this every week. You know, when we first started this uh, back, you know, two years ago, we really weren't sure where this was going, if we were going to do it for a couple of weeks and then say, ah, yeah, that's not working or not. But um, it's been a great ride. And, uh, you know, I enjoy coming here and chatting EVs with you guys. And it seems like the, uh, our community enjoys uh, having us come up here and, and talk about EVs. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been a great run and let's go for another hundred. But um, Kyle, quick question as far as range. Um, so we did the plaid. I did the Model S plaid and it ended up with uh, 300 miles on the nose. 
Now you've done the EQS and um, in, without the right, the perfect tire and wheel combo and all that, you end up with 344. We haven't been able to grab a Model S um, with the 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 basic wheels what are they called i know they're not called aero wheels um, well just the the regular wheels yeah i know but they have a name i can't think of the name right and now wheels or something like that yeah, yeah. I, I there are model s brand new model s not non-plaid available on toro uh by me here but they all have the arachnid wheels because everybody wants those they look so much nicer the than the than the base wheels so um we've got to grab one of those kyle one of these days because we've done lucid now now you've done eqs i'm getting an eqs in april i asked for one um uh to be delayed a little bit until the end of april so i would have that the right temperature uh and uh, so i'm going to get one then maybe it'll have the better i'm sure it won't have winter tires by then so i'll do this i'll repeat the eqs test with standard tires and um but we still have to get a model s and and do it with uh with, with the standard wheel so I mean, if any of the 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 inside of these podcast community out there knows where we can get one and someone will loan us one, please let us know. Yeah, I tried. I put out a thing on Twitter. You know, living in North Carolina previously, I knew everyone who had a Tesla, and we always had access to the cars. And then moving out here to Colorado, um, we haven't just had that ability to meet so many Tesla owners. So I, I'm actually going to start going to Tesla owners meetups. I mean, I own a car and, and just to get to know more people. Um, but uh, I put a thing out on Twitter and said, hey, I, we need a dual motor long range Model S. My plan was to run them side by side, the EQS and the dual motor Model S, same charging stations, the whole bit, same conditions. And we, yeah, just couldn't, couldn't track down a Model S uh, dual motor, but I really wanted to do them back to back. Yeah, that would have been, that would have been good. But one way or another, we've got to get one because so many people, um, Tesla fans, uh, they'll post on social media or whatever. They'll criticize us for not doing that car yet, you know. And they're like, you know, you guys with this Lucid and now EQS, why haven't you tested the the Tesla? And we can't get one. All these other companies give us the cars to do the to to do the range tests, but Tesla, you know, we know Tesla doesn't do that. Tesla won't even answer a, a question if we try to email them a question, let alone give us a car. And it's not just us. It's not like they don't like Kyle and me. They, they just don't communicate with the press. So we have to get Teslas from owners in order to do these range tests. So um, I just putting it out there. If anybody knows where somebody has a, a, a 2022 Model S with the standard wheels, please let us know. We'll pay to rent it for the day. <laughs> Oh, pay. Wow. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think I, we'll pay whatever. Yeah. I mean, we, okay. we just need to get this car done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I paid $1,200 for the day to rent the plaid. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, I build inside EVs, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're lucky you can do that. That's awesome. That's an option. I just well, have to build myself for yeah. it. Well, the thing is, what killed me, the car wasn't that much, but the miles, they only typically on tour, you get 100 miles for the day. Oh. So I drove 300 mile rent and then it's like a dollar a mile on top of it. Oh, so, so I, I it might have been more, but it's like two dollars a mile. Well, so the new like expensive cars, they really hit you on overages. So it was 300 miles alone for the range test. Plus, I mean, I had to pick it up, drive it to the charging station, charge it up and then return it. So I drove like 400 miles in, in the day with it. That's why it costs so much. Right on. All right. Um, so anything else you want to tell us about the 450 uh, plus EQS? Yeah, I mean, we, we've spoken about it. I've driven it many times. I've probably done 1,500 miles in EQS in every variant now. And uh, they're all amazing to drive. The most comfortable electric car. This and e-tron really compete. And honestly, the Lucid Air is a very comfortable tuned suspension as well. Uh, love the car. Don't like the way it looks. But now that I'm actually living with it, you know, I, this is the first time I've had one at home. I've always right. had EQS out on programs when we go drive them, we get them for a day and then we have to put them away. And so I really took the time to go through every setting, every menu in this car. I actually made a whole video about it because I was so blown away. And little things where when I sit in the car, it will recognize my face versus Jordan's face or Timon's face. And go to my profile and it says and oh, then it sweet. says welcome kyle connor just because it looked at me or it could recognize my voice or i can use my fingerprint and i can tune the sound system exactly how i want it and it goes through this whole like 15 step process with pre-programmed sounds and you can say i like this one better and that one it's like when you get your eyes checked number one or number two and it's really uh, an interesting uh car to really spend time with um 
love love everything about it except the way it looks. I think it's really freaking ugly the more I look at it. But that's just, you know, <laughs> it wouldn't impact my buying decision, but it's just not a good looking car. Yeah, it's yeah. I'm thinking I'm thinking the EQE, the smaller version, the E series size, the EQ uh, electric yep. Mercedes is going to look a little bit better in that sort of styling. It looks like 1% better. I've seen it in person. I've seen the AMG EQE in person and it's like a bit better. But like at the end of the day, when you're spending this one spec to 122,000, which I think is very reasonable for what you get out of this car when you compare it with the competition. I mean, okay. Tycon, like a base Tycon with a couple options thrown in there, you're looking in that same price range. So I think it's a reasonable offering uh, for the money. But I think when you're spending that kind of money, it should look really good. And I think, Tom, you, maybe you and I have agreed on this, maybe not, but like if they just made it look a little bit more traditional and given up 30 miles of range, I think that would have been the right compromise, in my opinion. I think so, especially now that we need see really just how good the range is. You know, at, at – Three, uh, 344 miles in the winter with winter tires at a steady 70 miles an hour. If that number came in at 315, you know, would yeah, make we'd no be difference. Right. It would make no difference. Yeah, to, to, it, to, wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. And right. keep in mind, the EPA is 350. So it matched its EPA combined on the highway pretty much. Wow. That's... On winter tires. And on what was winter the temperature? Tire. So the car was actually on the window sticker. I was excited because it said 20 inch wheels, which are like the aero plated ones. And then the car shows up on these beautiful looking 21 inch wheels. And I'm like, oh crap, here we go. And yep, we had Blizzak Bridgestone tire, Bridgestone Blizzak LM005 tires on it. And um, that was kind of a bummer. They're soft. The car's not designed for winter tires, I'll tell you that much. This thing going around corners is super floaty and ABS is hitting away at the brake pedal. The brake pedal is still really bad in the car. We're going to actually evaluate that after this podcast out on the, the runway and just kind of explain to viewers what we're talking about. We're bringing a whole bunch of EVs out there. Um, so stay tuned to Out of Spec Reviews next week where you'll see a ton of weird and different videos. That's great. Um, that's great that you have a, the use of a runway too for, for shooting like cars like, today's our first day that we have access to it to film so i'm really looking forward to it that's that's kind of special there's only a few outlets that really get a chance to do runways on a regular you know we're basis. coming right for car wow everyone watch out <laughs> <laughs> matt a, watson we're coming for you that's a uk outlet right uh martin yeah yeah he does all right just a few million views of most of his videos so yeah, yeah like matt. he's good all right he's he's, he's really um uh, He's really improved, actually. I think over the last few years, he's really developed his on-screen personality and his knowledge about electric vehicles as well. It's, kind of, it's nice, though, nice to watch him sometimes. Yeah, anyway, I, I like watching. But, his but watch Kyle Connors. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm joking when I say we're going after them. We're we're in our little tiny corner somewhere over here. We don't even matter on the blip. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll start doing drag races. All right. So, um, man. Okay, we should. Hustle oh, by the way, I bit. found I found episode one. By the way, oh, uh, we talked about Rivian. So I imagine you know a hundred episodes later we'll be talking about Rivian. If we do had you, a, <laughs> do you want to you want to play uh, just a, a short sure. clip of that? <laughs> oh, do I want to yeah, play? Watch it? Just see, see what we all look like. Oh uh, goodness! Okay, let me un unmute my screen and probably unmute. I have everything on mute when I'm doing this, and right. so first ever Inside EVs podcast. Can you hear that? Today, we'll be talking about the yeah. production delay okay. of the Rivian R1T all-electric pickup truck, the like, Tesla Model Y teardown video series like I by can't Monaro talk. He needs to go. the <laughs> Tesla Model S performance increase with its new Cheetah Stance launch mode, and much, much more. Wow. Thanks I for totally don't us. remember that intro. We, we had production it. values. <laughs> Look at that. And what happened to us? <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome wow, to the Inside EVs hair. podcast. Different the glasses. podcast from Inside EVs. I'm Dominic I'm Keone. still adjusting my I'm, hair all the time. Uh, Inside <laughs> EVs editor and Inside <laughs> EVs forum moderator. Okay. Uh, this is episode sound, number though. one. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> look at those guys. They're so fresh faced and young and, and <laughs> there's less gray hair. We look <laughs> miserable and we still are miserable. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, Martin, you look like Harry Potter there. <laughs> 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 oh dear, right. maybe uh, well, that's crazy. I, we'll forget uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so moving right along, uh, Kyle, Kyle uh, you also had a. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> I don't want so this to be a Kyle show. 
man. Um, <laughs> you you do. I would just want to talk a little bit because about the Tesla Model Three performance mm. uh, because you drove it this week. <laughs> you did a little fun little thing with it that I wanted to wanted you to tell us about and hopefully the video that you made. Um, so you took a Tesla Model Three performance, yours I presume, and put all like little spare tires on it or something, and then took it on a track. What was up with that? Well, um, I've always had this desire to do this where I don't know if you guys remember, there was an old Chris Harris video where he had a C63 and he put it on Space Saver spare tires and <laughs> drifted around one of the proving grounds in the UK. And I was like, that's the coolest freaking thing ever. And I've never seen anyone do it since then. And so a couple of years ago, we did a, a, a ad deal, a sponsorship thing with a Tesla accessory company called Modern Spare who makes spare tires for Teslas. And it's a great accessory. I highly recommend it. It saved me from being stranded actually twice now. And so you just need a spare tire living out here in the mountains and it's come in handy and it's pretty much the only one that works really well. Everyone uses them. And so I said, hey, can you just send me four of these things? And they said, yep. <laughs> I'm like, we're doing a stress test. And basically, you know, they had no idea. We had no idea if the wheels and tires could handle the huge loads that we're putting on it. You know, this is high speed, big undulations coming up and slamming the car down in, in gullies sideways. And it's been incredible to, uh, to do these things. So we... Uh, well, that's just Baltimore for you, Mark. Someone saw Crown <laughs> Vic on three spares and one normal tire. Pretty good ratio. Um, <laughs> if you're in Baltimore, that's that's luxury. So really enjoyed it. And honestly, the tires had a lot more grip than I thought. So the speeds were still quite high. We'll have a video coming, not this week, but maybe next week. I don't know. Um, but but we just had a blast sliding this car around, finishing off the tires. And yeah, just burning rubber on four spare tires. It was great. So, so you posted a, either a picture or a short video clip of loading those tires up in like the back of a of a car. Yeah, I forget was that on Twitter or something, or yeah. maybe it was on Teams. I'm not sure. It was on Twitter. And yeah, I, I thought you were doing that with an i3. It looked like <laughs> i3 right. wheels. Was I was like, he's do you get an i3 to track or like you know I because I didn't read exactly what you were doing with those because and it's funny. That's how skinny stock i t i three wheels are. They're like donut spares. <laughs> yep, that they're, they're actually like I think thirty mils or forty mils narrower than an i three. It's really a motorcycle sized tire, yeah. uh, and we put it on a you know four thousand pound nearly Tesla Model three and slid it around, bumped the tire pressures up pretty high so it could handle the weight. And uh, what a, what a neat experience it was. But yeah, really destroyed the tires to you know the point of explosion yeah they were done yeah they oh yeah, yeah. Done. we had to, uh, we were actually letting air pressure out on a couple of them that didn't explode because it looked like they were about to pop right. <laughs> and one of them like exploded and pulled the bumper off in the back and then we just Oops. pushed it back on and it was fine so like yeah but these are the fun things you get to do when your car is reaching the point where no one wants it it's not worth as much so we can start playing around oh man you treated your cars like that when they're brand new. Who are you kidding? Yeah, that's true. And they hold up just fine. I don't know why people made me their cars. Jordan, Jordan tells us 135 width spare down from 235 width normal, which is a, a big difference. Yes. Yeah. And the 235s are the narrow, narrowest tire that we run on that car. Right. All right. Uh, so, Tom, um, you had some time with the Jaguar I Pace. I think we talked a little bit about it last week, but you had just gotten it. And uh, but you've now you've had a whole week with it and you've done like a range test in wintery kind of conditions, I guess. Yeah. So we did the uh, 70 mile an hour higher range test. Uh, it's pretty cold here in New Jersey. So it was a winter range test. And it also had the uh, 22 inch wheels on it. So it wasn't the 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 optimal wheels that you would want for a range test and like kyle when i got the spec sheet from jaguar it said that it had the 20 inch wheels uh, so i i was like i was kind of psyched about that because you know that's kind of what you want to, to for, for the range test. i mean in a perfect world we'd do it with both but we don't have that much access um, and uh so it arrives and so i reached back out to the company that facilitates these um loans and they said yeah we um jaguar didn't want you to have it without winter tires this car just came in their fleet it had like 500 miles on it when i got it so we swapped it with the we only had winter tires for their for their 22 inch wheels 
Okay. So they they threw the 22 inch wheels on it with the winter tires. I really didn't need them. It wasn't snow or ice this week, but I guess for it looks insurance great with reasons, 22s. for safety. Oh, they look awesome. I mean, that's the wheels you want if you're buying this car. Uh, but you know, uh, you know, for the range test, I was hoping to get the the, the the standard 20s. It would have definitely done a little bit better, and uh, it didn't do great. It ended up with 195 miles. I'm at, uh, actually exactly the same as the Hyundai Ionic 5 did when I did that uh, about a month ago. Uh, uh -huh. Neither one, I, I haven't actually put either one of those videos up on Inside of yet. I'm, I'm, I'm editing them. And I'm actually holding the Jaguar video because I'm a, I have, I'm a little confused. When uh, a, a couple months ago, there was a bunch of news outlets announced that for 2022, the I-PACE's range was going to increase to 253 miles. The... Um, for the first two years or three years it's been out now, or was it two, two years? Well, since since its inception, it's been EPA range rated at 234 miles per charge. And it, from what I understood, it was going to up, it was going to go up to 253 for, for model year uh, 2022. So I get the car and I do the range test. And in the range test, I'm actually, I actually say that, you know what, from what I understand, the range is going to be increased for the 2022 model year to 253. Then they send me the Monroney label. And so that usually happens before we get the car, but they didn't have it. And I, there was some kind of delay. And it says 222 miles, Ooh. which is less than what previous years had. So now I'm really crazily confused. So I, I email the company back and said, look, please clarify this. So, they're, so they said, no, 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 the, it, there's a mistake on that. It should be the same as last year, 234. So now I'm emailing Jaguar and saying, look, please straighten this out for me. I need to know what's going to be, what's the EPA range rating for, the, for, for this vehicle? Because from what we understood, it was supposed to go up. Uh, and so I really don't know. It's not listed on the EPA site yet. So maybe it hasn't been certified. But um, I was under the impression they were squeezing out, you know, another 19 miles or something like that for, uh, for the 2022 model year. Uh, but now I'm really not sure what the, what the range rating is going to be. We finished up with 195 miles, not great, but not terrible for freezing temperatures with 22 inch wheels with with brand new winter tires. So the tires were, you know, probably the worst you could have on it for this uh, range test. Even though the modern winter tires now are get are much better than efficient efficiency wise than than uh, winter tires were 10, 15 years ago, where they were only optimized for the maximum grip in, in on snow and ice, and now. The tire manufacturers are getting better, and while they provide great grip on snow and ice, they also don't really hurt your efficiency that much. Uh, so it's it's not that big of a difference. But so, I, question for you, Tom: When uh, we've been range testing EVs for I don't know five years, something like that. When uh, when does it stop mattering? Like we're I think we should always do the tests. Mm -hmm. but at what point is it where? When we see people can like uh, when I was doing my live stream yesterday, we were getting so many comments over and over. What's the best range for the price? And if you look at dollar amount per miles of range, I think probably the Lucid Air probably comes on top. And they're like, well, that car's expensive. But I'm like, well, if you look at dollar for price, that one actually may be the best. I don't know. I'm just making this up. I, I haven't run the numbers. But I'm just saying, at what point does range become less of an issue? Because even years ago, you road tripped a Mini Cooper SE from New Jersey to North Carolina and back, which for many people is the longest trip they'll ever do. Um, what, what's your opinion on that? Because it's great to do the tests. I think we should always do them. But when does it stop becoming a buying decision? Yeah. Um, you know, Kyle, I think range is going to be at the center of electric vehicle questions for a long time. Uh, you know, people are still, I mean, don't forget, we're at what, two, three percent nationally adoption rate. Uh, I know there's some pockets of the country that are much more, but even at the, the high end, California, the most, it's like 15 percent. I think I could be wrong. That changes all the time. So, you know, you got to remember, you know, 90 plus percent of the country has no experience with electric vehicles, uh, you know, and 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 they've been hearing uh, through the media and, you know, through uh, you know, a number of sources for the last five or six years since EV, since people started talking about EVs, that they don't go very far and they take hours to charge. So, you know, I had a conversation. I had a guy at my house doing plumbing work yesterday and, uh, you know, you know, he saw all the charging stations in my garage and he was like, dude, I got to ask you what the hell's going on out there? 
And, uh, you know, cause I got, <laughs> well, you know, and, uh, that's and, a long uh answer. yeah, and, uh, yeah, exactly. So we start talking about it, you know, his first answer, the guy, he has a pickup truck and you know, that's his daily driver, you know, Silverado. And he's like, Oh, those things suck. Like I would never get an EV. And, uh, and, you know, and so we're talking, he's a nice guy. And, you know, I said, well, what are you, what are your concerns? And that was it, you know, dude, he's like, you know, they don't go, they don't go far and they take hours to charge. I, I don't, I can't live my life like worrying to, you know, to, to take hours to, if I'm driving down to whatever he named the state far away, you know, I, um, I, I can't have my trip take twice as long. And, you know, so that's not the reality today. It won't take twice as long, you know, it'll take a little bit longer, but you can go anywhere. I mean, nobody knows better than Kyle that you can go anywhere um, uh, with an electric vehicle. And it, yes, it will take you longer, but not nearly as long, more time than what you, than what most people think. So, um, I know this is a long answer to Kyle's question, but Kyle, um, I think it's going to be the center of attention at least through this decade. Um, I totally and, agree. I was, I was just curious your opinion. I'm right yeah. there with you. I think uh, these 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 range questions will be uh, yeah by far till the end of the 2020s. And then what I hope we see eventually is some of the early adopters, people that have been driving EVs from the time you have been, Tom, or myself a little bit later, maybe start to see, okay, well, I really don't need a 150 kilowatt hour pack to haul around. We'll see smaller batteries, hopefully as charging increases. I mean, Ionic 5, I think is very forethought or very for forward thinking mm -hmm. because it has, they could have put a bigger battery in it. I was on the phone with the engineers. They're like, yeah, we could have put a bigger battery. In it would have increased cost. Um, and we charge really fast. So what do you need the big battery? I'm like, you guys and I get it. But a lot of people still, we have a long ways to go. No, I agree. Um, and I want to flip, I want to flip that from how far does it go to have the conversation to how fast does it charge? Um, yeah. and, and I think that's yeah. really what we have to focus on because totally agree. Char charging speeds are dramatically increasing. And went with, um, you know, ubiquitous uh, public high-speed charging, the range problem goes away. It really does. Um, you know, if if it's a ten or fifteen-minute stop, uh, you know, to on on even if the even every hundred and fifty miles, like if you don't have a super long electric vehicle, if you if we can compress that stop to ten to fifteen minutes, uh, then all of a sudden it doesn't matter if it goes four hundred miles or two hundred miles because it's a fifteen-minute stop. So, you know, I think that's really what we have to push the conversation to, to charging speeds. And uh, because I think the charging speeds and the, and the availability of public charging is going to outpace mm. the ranges, the range increase on the cars. And uh, I think once that really gets to a point where we have charging stations everywhere, and that's going to happen, and it's going to happen quickly, I believe, you know, in this one as quickly as this decade. Um, then it doesn't matter with uh, really how far it goes, in my opinion. And I think, and I've been saying this for years, I think the ranges are going to go up, 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 up. And then around 2026, 2027, we're going to see the average range of electric vehicles start creeping back down. And I don't think they're going to continue to go up. I don't think in, in uh, 10 years from now, in 2032, uh, we're going to be trying to get 400 miles EVs on the road. I think, I think we're going to settle in at around 250, 300. And they'll be fine. Yes, there'll be some and premium EVs that have longer range. But I think that 250 to 300 miles is going to be a sweet spot if we can easily recharge these vehicles quickly. Totally agree. Right there with you. I'm kind of I'm interested in efficiency as well. It's not as, as kind of a sexier point to talk about, but I've been driving a an original Ionique and uh, I borrowed it from a friend. Uh, not the Ionic 5, but original Hyundai Ionic, the original one. So that's got a, I didn't even look. What is that? 20 something kilowatt hour? Yeah, pack? but the most efficient thing on wheels. Yeah, I drove yeah, home. Nice from, and late, yeah. I drove home from his and it was like five point something miles per kilowatt hour. And I was like, right, let's go. Let's go and have a play. And I was driving around at seven miles per kilowatt hour because I was playing. I was, I was, yeah. <laughs> you know, I was. I was driving that way uh, just to see, and it was like 30 miles an hour around where I live. So it, it wasn't on the highways, but still it was a real reminder to me as well. Cause I jumped back in the MG behind me and that'll do 3.1, 3.2 miles per kilowatt hour. It's fabulously inefficient. And that was a reminder. Actually that debate about what is your use case for what vehicle that, uh, that original Ionique, which has got heated steering wheel, heated seats, memory seats. Uh, like it was an amazing spec and what what are you going to do with a car? If that's what you want to do a car with, and, and do a you know hundred miles here, hundred miles there. What a great little thing that is! 
with a very small battery, nice and lightweight, charge is quick enough. What more do you want? So that efficiency conversation should be had as well, because anyone can make a pretty inefficient electric vehicle. There's plenty of those out there. Yep. <laughs> so well, the, the, Nick, talking Nick, about inefficient, the iPace finished up with the second least efficient vehicle we've ever tested on the on the highway range test. Kyle's got the uh, crown for the least efficient when he did the uh, Audi e-tron, and that was 2.3 miles per kilowatt hour. The iPace sizzling. Yeah, the 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 iPace finished up 2.37 miles per kilowatt hour, just slightly <laughs> better than than than, than the uh, iPace. But listen, That's really close. It was really close, and I, I still I, I would take the iPace and its inefficiency. I think it's such an underappreciated electric vehicle. Uh, I really like the iPace, and uh, it's a shame that it doesn't do uh, better than than it was sales wise. And and talking about sales wise. A friend of mine, um, I t who uh, he's on like his fifth Jaguar. He just likes Jags. He lives locally to me here. He saw me in it, uh, and uh, he asked me to take him for a ride. He's got an F pace now. His lease is up in about a year. Uh, I took him for a spin. He he called up his dealer and put in an order. He's, wow, he's, nice. He's, yeah, he's, nice. he said when my uh, when my F pace lease is up, and they the, of course they told him we have no idea when we can get this. It might be like a year, and he's like, yeah. I don't care, just extend my F-Pace lease, put in the order now. And when you, when you get it, I'll trade in the F-Pace. If it's early, we'll, we'll make a deal and you're going to eat the rest of my lease. But if it's later, just extend me month to month till it comes in. So I sold an I-Pace this week. <laughs> nice. On commission. Sadly I love not. that car. That is one of the best driving EVs mm. from a chassis perspective, from throttle. Yeah. It's so performance oriented. I love that when they launched that car, they did the launch in Portugal. They have it like True. ripping around Portimao or one of those, one of those, the circuit. That's a, that was it. Yeah. Portimao. Yep. And they are just like hooning this eye face around. I'm like, wow, that's really freaking cool. Then they made like, they brought all the worst specs to the U S <laughs> and then no one bought it because there was no charging infrastructure when this car launched. We talked about this last week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think if they relaunched that car, put a marketing campaign behind it, maybe up did it did an 800 volt redo. I don't know. The, the shape is wonderful. Put in a better UI, even though they've updated it over time. It's much better, Kyle. The new yeah, one. Yeah. Right. You know, this year for 2022, it had a major upgrade for the for the, the yeah. entertainment system. So much better. Yeah, it's much better, but it's still not Tesla levels good. Like mm -hmm. I think they really can you know, get in there and do the Pivi Pro system or whatever that's in the new Land Rover stuff. Um, yeah, and, and I think it would do well. They just, I, I don't think they want to sell any of them, in my opinion. Maybe. Yeah, this is, yeah. Uh, just one, one other thing about the launch. They also did an off-road course and they did some crazy hill climbing. That thing's got some off-road chops as well. I think it'll afford like 30 or more inches of water, maybe 36, I'm not sure exactly. But does uh, it float read like your owner's manual? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they don't float. <laughs> Yeah, because I mean, the well, bag's like, here's your actual water waiting depth. And Elon's like, drive it into the ocean. It floats. Except that was a, there's an issue in, in Finland right now. Uh, a, a, somebody's pack got water in it somehow, and it's, Tesla's not uh, honoring their warranty on it because they, I don't, I don't know. It's an no. issue anyway. I don't think we've written that story up yet, but uh, if you, I don't know if you could, wow. Anyway, it's happening. It's, someone I, I someone Finland, told me recently. Iceland. The Nissan Leaf wading depth is 700 millimeters, which is, I don't know what it is in your language. Uh, <laughs> you know, no, 70, no correlation here. 70, 70 <laughs> centimeters, uh, like two, two points something feet. And that's pretty good. That's really good. If it's like, over a foot, that's impressive for a passenger oh no, car. It's, it's over two feet. Yeah, like the Nissan amazing. Leaf, the, the, the breather valve on that battery somewhere is so high up in the car. I was oh, like, let me go check this out. That person's pulling my leg. They're winding me up. And no, 2.3 feet. What? Official wading depth of the Nissan Leaf. We got to make a video. There's a leaf point, in the fleet. I'm going to do three. that. I'm like, no, no, no. It can't be right. Official <laughs> wading depth. It's like an off-roader. Wow. Wow, we, we need to put an Outlander spec of Nissan Leaf. I never thought about that. <laughs> yeah, so be... Dominic, didn't you drive the prototype Leaf with the all-wheel drive system in it? I did, the new one coming so up, yes. You get that, put, and then you put a, some suspension lift blocks on it, and now you have yourself a Crosstrek killer. That there would be go. an awesome car, actually. That was a great drivetrain. That's coming on the Aria in all-wheel drive. It's uh, It could be pretty hot. E4, uh, right? All-wheel drive, something like that? 
uh, E Force. That sounds yeah. familiar. E Force. Yes, it's, it yeah, was E, but the number four, and, and then Force is like. <laughs> so it was the new R. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Type out. Uh, yep. Anyway, so we should move along. Uh, so there's a big to do this week about Rivian. Um, so they they had a and Tom, you're on the bleeding edge of the story because you have a Rivian uh, on reservation. And uh, you heard from them directly, I guess, that they're raising the price and some other issues. Uh, what, what's ha- tell us what's happened there. Yeah. So um, what a week for Rivian. Jeez. Man. Talk about, you know, the bad way to come out and make an announcement and then have to backtrack. So what happens was um, we got notification from Rivian uh, that they were going to be raising prices on R1T and R1S. Uh, the R1T was going to have approximately a 17% price increase. The R1S approximately 20% price increase. Uh, I know. And, and, but the killer was it was going to take effect for all reservation holders. You only were going to be exempt if your vehicle was currently in production or as they told me in the final stage of, um, uh, you know, solidifying your order, which would be if you're actively talking with Rivian now and 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 your car's going to go in production in like the next week. Um, everyone else was going to have to pay these price increases. So as you can imagine, people just, you know, lost it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the online forums went, were crazy. People yeah. were holding, um, uh, you know, a lot of polls and uh, I saw polls that were 40 to 50 percent of the people, even higher, were saying that they're canceling their reservation. Um, we had people posting on Twitter uh, the screenshot of their canceled Rivian reservation. And, you know, this is that, that's an enormous price increase when you think about it. My R1T is pretty loaded uh, and it was uh, 86000 I think $100 or $86,400. And uh, after the price increase, when you, you went uh, a, a few hours later, you could go back onto Rivian's website. It refreshed your order. It was a uh, 100000 Six hundred dollars, I think. So yeah. So my, my 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 car went up fourteen thousand. My vehicle went up fourteen thousand plus dollars, which is you know right in line with what they said about seventeen percent. They didn't just raise the base price; they also raised the price of the options and decontented the vehicle. Like the things that were standard were no longer standard, like the 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 automatic to new cover. You know, that was all of a sudden that was standard on all RNTs, no longer. Now you had to pay for it. The spare tire was standard on uh, on the V on my vehicle, at least my order. I think um, it was I think it was standard on now. Uh, now I'm not sure. But in any event, now it cost more money. So every, there were more line items and uh, and and the vehicle was 17, about 17 percent more. So as you can imagine, people just lost it. People were canceling their orders. And literally, was it a day later or two days later? I'm not. Uh, I think it was the next day. I think it was the next day. Yeah. Um, Rivian comes back and says, uh, or, or RJ, um, the CEO, made a, a statement saying that, you know, um, we made a mistake and uh, we shouldn't have done this. And, uh, you know, he was, you know, very uh, apologetic and said, you know, I'm going to make mistakes. Rivian's going to make mistakes. This was a mistake. It's the biggest mistake we've ever made. It's and, two days. Uh, and uh, while we will be putting the price increases into effect, they will not relate to or they won't be effective for the c- current reservation holders. So people that currently have the reservation are still going to be able to get their vehicle with the same uh, price that they were originally promised. But all new orders moving forward are going to have uh, that price increase. So um you know, I mean, just t- mismanaged from 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 the beginning. Uh, I think if they would have come out and said, and you know, they they talked about why they had to do this, and it makes sense. You know, that to be honest with you, v- Rivian announced their initial pricing in 2018. Okay, when they when they originally you know right. showed showed the vehicle, so that that's four years ago, uh, and pr- everything goes up. But you know, when they you would think when they announced the pricing, they had the the future cost of the vehicle in mind, you know, they didn't just say, oh, if we built it today, it would cost this so we could sell it. You know, you would think they had that all planned in. But the thing is, they didn't plan in a global pandemic where they had to right. shut down. And the vehicle got delayed a year or eight, nine months, whatever it was. They didn't plan this unprecedented 
supply chain disruption and shortages where everything costs more now and yeah. every all of the all of our listeners out there know that this is the truth i mean you, you go a cup of coffee at the corner coffee shop costs more than it did six months ago everything costs more now and and it's just hard to get supplies so um you know it's not unsurprised i'm not surprised that they have to do a price increase i'm surprised that they just said everyone's going to pay this if they would have come out and said look here's where we're at now we have to do a price increase um what we're going to do is we'll we're going to give the our reservation holders a 50 percent discount on the price increase yes they're going to have to pay it also but we're, we're going to give you a 50 percent discount uh or, or some some type of a discount i think they could have gotten away with that i think a lot of people would have understood that look you know we understand everything costs more now but the fact that they weren't giving reservation holders people that plunked down their money three years ago weren't giving them a red cent you know and and, and just saying you're going to pay the same as somebody who plunks down money uh six months from now or six weeks from now whatever i think that that angered a lot of people and rightfully so i mean i i wasn't that upset because i mean it's a little different for me um we're gonna we're we're buying this vehicle for for work you know for content i'm gonna use it kyle's gonna Kyle and I are going to collaborate on some things, you know, so it's a little bit different, different for me than for the average buyer that already stretched their budget. And now they're being told, you know what, you're going to give us an extra $15,000. And we really don't care that you that you've been a loyal reservation holder for the last two and a half years. So, I mean, this thing was just totally botched, totally mishandled from the beginning. And and now you see um, there's reports coming out that in that lawsuit that and God, I forget her name. Her last name is Schwab, Laura Schwab. Um, where she's suing Rivian for the glass ceiling uh, lawsuit. She's uh, um, actually alleging that these price increases were, these were not due to this recent, um, uh, you know, supply chain, supply chain shortage and, and COVID disruption and all that, that this was planned all along, that Rivian was putting out false low numbers when they first launched a vehicle and that they all along were going to wait until after they went public and then raise the prices for everyone that this was planned from day one and uh you know we have no way of knowing that was true or not but it is what schwab is alleging but it seems world. reasonable because uh that would be a very bad strategy though man that's mm. geez i mean maybe but uh, either way i don't know what their strategy is or or if these talks happen the trucks were too cheap i mean like the prices were incredible right. and we we always said this on this podcast i said it when i reviewed the vehicle that this is an insane value for like 75 77 grand to get 135 kilowatt hour pack with four motors a beautifully designed interior you add some options on tom's had everything for 84. i mean you look at this eqs right which has a smaller battery pack one motor and the thing's 122 and i'm here saying that seems reasonable this was a deal and so i think the new prices are totally in line by the way i think the truck's worth every penny of it uh they just went about it the wrong way and i think one thing we haven't mentioned yet is that even if you did cancel because of the price increases right. they let you back in at the original price but we don't know if you hold your original place in line okay oh. so they did say we will restore your place in line oh okay, okay. And, and and one thing and th there's more complicated than this i have to uh, tell the full story i forgot to mention so it, initially when they announced that there was going to be doing price increases they gave um their reservation holders a, a way that they could retain the same price that they had locked into with their original order to retain the same price you had to go to a new configuration that Rivian just announced a dual motor setup and they're going to have uh the dual motor setup are is going to include two motors that are dis engineered designed and built in-house by Rivian the the quad motor system uh uses motors that were sourced from Bosch so Rivian's making their own motors now and it's a dual motor system and uh, that vehicle is going to be more efficient it's actually going to get a higher EPA range rating uh mm -hmm. and but you so in order to get dollar for dollar the same price you had to take the dual motor system now to me that's not that big of a of a drop down i think most most 26, people it's only 600 horsepower man 
Yeah, it's only 600 <laughs> plus horsepower, and it can tow the same amount as the uh, as the quad motor system can. Um, you know, and, and what the what's the quad mode? A little more than 800 horsepower. 800 something. So yeah, yeah 600, and it goes zero to 60 in four seconds. The quad yeah. motor does it in three. I mean, I, I know more is always better, but come on, you four know, is I, plenty I, fast in these pickup trucks. It really truck. is for a pickup <laughs> truck. Holy that's God. that's nuts. So, <laughs> but so, but that wasn't the killer. The killer was you also had to accept the new battery pack that they're introducing. It's a smaller battery pack. So now. Oh, and one more thing. You've got to wait another two years. Oh, right. So because it's not going to be ready. So sure, we're giving you a way where you can keep the same amount of money, you know, that you committed to. But you have to take our dual motor system instead of quad motor. Eh, that's not that big of a difference for me. It wouldn't prevent me from buying it. Um, you've got to take a smaller battery pack that they're estimating is going to be EPA range rated at 260 miles. Now, they're estimating the dual motor large pack is going to be 320 plus miles so you know they're saying you're you're giving up 60 miles of range in the battery pack and this version isn't going to be available till at least 2024 so yeah. just let us keep your deposit for another two years you're getting 60 miles of less range you're you're getting two less motors but all's good we gave you a way to just keep your reservation and have the and not pay a penny more so that's a bitter that, pill. Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah that's, that's a tough right. pill. Yeah, that's but thankfully right. it's all sorted now. Yeah. So yeah, uh, it's about. I, I was just. But it's not, it. Kyle. It's uh, not. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's sorted. Well, it's sorted in that reservation holders get to keep it for the original, but it's not like okay, let's you know, let's just move on. You know, Rivian right. is the same as they were a, a week ago. No, no, this is trust this, has been broken. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm has not been broken. I totally agree that it was a big disaster. People not from a public looking at standpoint. Rivian the same they did seven same way they did seven days ago. The stock yeah. price is tanking. I mean, I'm not a stock guy. I don't want to talk stocks, but the, the stock price has hit its all time low. Hmm. Uh, people are people are looking at the company in a different light, light light right now and saying, you know, is this the company that we thought it was? And that's that's going to have long lasting effects. Yeah, they're yeah. down under 50. I don't know what they were at before, Tom and I both. But yeah, look, it's just. Well, that's yeah. like half of what they really started. <laughs> that going. way is bad. This yeah. way is good. Yeah. Right. I, um, yeah. I saw I saw one headline this morning that said, RJ, it's fallen so much. RJ is no longer a billionaire. And I did some fake tears for him. What a shame. <laughs> He's no yeah. longer a billionaire. I, you know, it was it was a headline. It was a stat. <laughs> Who really cares? So that. That case that Tom highlighted where their vice president of sales and marketing is taking legal action against them, of course, we would find out in if that goes to court, we would find out, you know, if there's emails, if there's an email chain, if there's a if there's proof that something was being planned or nothing was being planned, or we don't know because we can't comment on this. Um but if that were to go to court and becomes a matter of public record, it would be very interesting to know. Even if they had a, a dis, you know, even if there's like an email chain where they were discussing options or something, um, it, but we will never will because these things are always, always settled out of court, especially when Rivian is so flush with money. Um, these things are always uh, settled out of court and with the contract that no one ever says a thing about the settlement and everyone moves on. So sadly, I don't think that's going to provide us with any insight Agreed. into the company. Money solves problems. Everyone's got a price, you know, and every, you know, I'm not saying that everyone's mercenary, but there's, there's an amount of money where someone says, okay, I agree to walk away from whatever was being alleged uh, or, or not, or maybe Rivian will say, Hey, we did nothing wrong. We'll see you for our day in court. I don't, we don't know, but, um, I highly doubt that will happen. So er, earlier in the chat, uh, Simon Matthews had asked, uh, or said most Rivian reservation holders unhappy, most, some were happy about it. And actually, yes. <laughs> so I, I was talking with somebody, um, and they were just they were like kind of excited that you know they thought, oh, maybe a bunch of people will cancel and I'll actually get my truck. That was sooner. me. You were talking to me. <laughs> no, I was it wasn't. <laughs> well, this is what I was saying. I'm like, this is the it. best I thing ever. <laughs> Everyone cancel now, please. I want the truck. Your truck right. turns. And out meanwhile, next week. Kyle's talking about my truck. Yeah, yes. I, well, I'm trying to. He doesn't yes. have a reservation. He's no, like, he'll oh, get Tom's going to move up. Because <laughs> yeah. Tom and I have agreed when he gets his, he's getting F-150 Lightning and Rivian. We're going to buy whichever one he doesn't like, as long as it's the Rivian. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and to be and honest, it probably you, will be. I wasn't happy. I, I wasn't. Ha I don't want the, the the Rivian earlier because I'm getting the the F-150. Well, my build uh, date is uh, or the week of May 16th. So pretty soon, two two months, two and a half months. I'm gonna I'm gonna have the F-150 Lightning. So I'm and Rivian had already sent me an email saying uh, October to December is my build window. Uh, yeah. So so you know I'm thinking that's perfect. I'll have the vehicle for four or five months. I'll have the F-150 Lightning for four or five months. I'll be able to do a ton of stuff with it before the, the Rivian comes. I wouldn't want to get them both at once. I, I like my head will explode. Like I won't know what to do. Mm. You know, so so um, now I'm thinking, honestly, I'm like, holy cow, like so many people are going to cancel. They're probably going to be calling me in like June to <laughs> say, you know, you know, do you know, we're, we're, we're going to start your build now because if we looked online at the polls and polls can be misleading. But I genuinely believe that a third of the people, that it's reasonable that yeah. a third of the people or more canceled their reservation or were going to, they were thinking about it, right. you know, because that, that, you know, a $15,000 price increase, even if they didn't want to cancel their reservation, that's going to push it out of a lot of people's budgets. But going back to what Kyle said before, he's hundred percent correct. The, um, the, 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 the Rivian while it's not, cheap it's it's still a very expensive vehicle for what you get it was a fantastic deal at the previous price it's now probably priced correctly uh, but they should yep. not have messed with people that had reservations yep yeah i saw one poll was there like around 62 percent with uh you know a number of, not, it's not a huge poll but it's, it's something and it wasn't about the money for people canceling it was the principle no. it was, people <laughs> felt wronged and well, you've for some people ask about the money, but like Twitter accounts and social accounts like this, and uh, Jason has replied down here. Yep. You know, but these guys have got massive audiences, and it's all yeah. very negative sentiment. And you know, if Jason Fensky says good or bad things, I mean, you know, no one's a lemming; they'll make their own mind up. But these are very influential, educated people who have, you know, not only big YouTube channels, but but have done a lot of thinking around this. And so it's really harmful um, to, to, to Rivian. Well, maybe we should have a RJ Scaringer. RJ, if you're watching, uh, come you're on the welcome. show. Right? You're very talk welcome. About this and talk about the actual, I want to hear more about the future of, uh, of uh, Rivian. You know, they have a big factory going up in, in Georgia now, where they're about to have. And, uh, you know, we were talking about this. We're talking about the stock better. price. Yeah. They were talking about the stock price earlier, and you know it, it was hugely over. I thought it was overvalued, like up over 120 whatever dollars a, a share. For, I, but I want to hear more about future plans for, for Rivian before you know. I think it's worth that much. You know, I think right now the price is kind of realistic. Actually, it kind of reflects what we know about the company now. Mm. Um, you know, I'm not a stock guy. Don't take my <laughs> my opinion doesn't mean that much. So don't listen to me. Basically. <laughs> talk to your financial advisor <laughs> but uh yeah that's just my opinion i, I just think it's well, okay that's about where it probably should be anyway I, you know yeah until we hear more about their plans how you know what what are you going to do to make yourself worth this much money you know but mm. anyway all right so we should probably move along we're already at an hour and we haven't touched our main stories for the day <laughs> let's get through them here we go yeah, I mean, Rivian like, was the main story of the week that is, yeah. really I mean, it's true they kind of was yeah you know in the electric vehicle world there's nothing bigger than what happened with Rivian this week what a disaster that's true it, yeah it's uh, it was it was two days before that went uh, went past from from the initial price change to the the walk back so it was like March first yep. to March third. So if you canceled on March first, not not in February, but if on once you heard the news, then you can get your place in line and your price restored. And uh, yeah, all right, okay. So in news this week, uh, Polestar Polestar revealed a new hardtop convertible sports car. Polestar's head of design, Maximilian uh, Mizzoni, uh, described it thusly. So Polestar O2 is our vision of a new era for sports cars by mixing the joy of open top driving with the purity of electric mobility it unlocks a new mix of emotions in the car. But as with all our cars, we are about more than just straight line sprints. It's when you are, when you turn the steering wheel that the true fun begins. So that's uh, promising then. I like that idea. Uh, a lot of the design language seems to be taken from the precept concept 
that concept is going to be put in production in 2024 as the Polestar 5. So it's possible that this might become the Polestar 6. Um, it would be the first mass-produced electric convertible um, that we know about anyway, I think. Uh, the concept has a drone that, <laughs> that talks on the back lid and supposedly autonomously creates like cinematic video while you're driving along. Uh, but that's like literally a flight of fancy that probably won't be on the production car. So uh, there's not a whole lot of way in, in the way of specs, but as you can see, it's pretty much perfect. It's got two doors, four seats, gold seat belts. Kyle, what more do you need besides maybe like a production date? Honestly, this thing is freaking hot, <laughs> isn't it? It looks right? so good. It has to be one of the best new car designs ever. And it fixes my biggest issue with the Precept, which is this little thing on the roof that looks weird on the regular one. So it's basically a convertible Precept. Um, the drone thing, yeah, that, the, uh, drones do yeah. that now. That wasn't that exciting. You, I can hit a follow mode on my drone and it just follows me around. Right. Um, but the car itself is... It's got a very Supra or Nissan Z raked roof line, very yeah. JDM roof, very Swedish, you know, sort of belt line down. It's got ID3 wheels. It is just the <laughs> best of everything in one car. I like it. So we we're talking on the Out of Spec podcast, we we're talking about my, 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 my two car solution, you know, what's yep. but my the best two vehicles. And I'm like, hmm, I really like the pickup truck. So, like, Rivian R01T is kind of got to be in there, but I'd like to a convertible sports car, a coupe. And, and, but there wasn't any a couple of days ago, but now there is. Well, it's still a concept, but this right. and a Rivian perfect two car solution for an EV nerd. It's awesome. No, no, no. Th this and the ID Buzz, that's the perfect solution. You all right, ID Buzz going. also, but then you also <laughs> need a manual transmission something, and then yeah, uh, you need a Tesla too because that performs well on YouTube. So like, yeah, need, okay, need we one need of everything. Five car garage, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> five car minimum. <laughs> so there's a um, there's not a whole lot of details about this thing uh, exactly. So we can't. There's not really a lot to talk about except that you know it's really awesome. Except the. Uh, it is made to be very recyclable, like all the materials in, in the Why interior. Why would you want are, to throw this thing away? Are all from, right? Um, well, maybe if it's got crashed or something, or something hits it, you know, then you got to say goodbye to get another one. We need to but, have that conversation because I don't think junkyards are going to pay attention to Polestar's recycling guidelines in the US. <laughs> They're just going to crush it. There's a lot of high grade aluminum and they've they've labeled the aluminum, like there's different qualities of aluminum. So they've labeled them all to make it easily uh to get better recycling value out of it and as well as the interior is all made from the same sort of uh uh whatever some sort of made from oil plasticky whatever thing um but it's all the same so it's e more easily recyclable anyway that's just part of the whole concept of being you know a low impact vehicle as well as uh i think they want to be zero carbon by 2030 if i remember correctly that's right Yes. Carbon neutral, yeah. I think. Carbon neutral, as as yeah, in, for every, the supply chain. So using right. using using blockchain technology to go right back to the mine and and know where everything has come from, rather than just a supplier dropping off some stuff at your doorstep and being told, yeah, yeah, this is all good. But really understanding your supply chain, um, you know, so so using those technologies that we have to um, ensure that maybe you're using you know recycled steel in uh that's been used with 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 renewable electricity rather than using a uh, coal which is how most steel is made so all of those things and uh it's it's a, an interesting conversation to have because it's easy to pay lip service to being you know green or just zero emissions at the tailpipe so for a lot of people that matters and for many it doesn't as well L leonard says oh god blockchain which is kind of like my, <laughs> my yeah it sounds like bit like bitcoin blockchain <laughs> it's all the yeah. same kind of thing yeah it's like, a way uh, it's, it's, just, roll my eyes. <laughs> it's just a way of, of of tracking uh where all the bits of your car have come from and that way when someone says oh evs are terrible because there's kids mining cobalt and you go okay well this we know it didn't so maybe some do but right. it's not us so right polestar is really setting a lot of things correctly i would say doing things correctly as far as sort of a old school some people would say legacy automaker would be uh you know just from their sales model to their marketing to their presentation their design the way they drive it's the most forward thinking we've seen from a traditional auto companies of mm -hmm. old and i think it's awesome well yeah i'm not sure if there's anything else you want to say about that tom 
So can they, can they sell this many? Can they sell enough sports cars to make it worth a while? They're, they're not. If they make it, it's not going to look like that. Um, I, I tell you, the front end of it really reminds me of the Roadster. Just the front. Um, that's when I first saw it. That's what I saw. No other part of the vehicle, but that front end definitely reminds me of the new uh, Roadster. But okay. uh, I think we I think we talked enough about a concept. It's okay. cool. But, okay. you know, make it not, well, never the, one, the one concept I really want to happen. <laughs> right. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> a concept that uh, Kyle loves. Uh, so in other news, uh, Polestar's parent company, Volvo, uh, released, released a product map at an event in Miami for its dealers. According to attendees, uh, won't spend any time on this really, but according to the attendees, the automaker has five upcoming battery electric vehicles, including a large and a small crossover a sedan, and two sporty wagon-like models, which they refer to as activity vehicles. So the first one we'll see is a full-size three-row crossover SUV with styling cues taken from Volvo's Concept Recharge, which Martin is showing us up on the screen if you're watching us on YouTube or Twitch, um, which is a you know a handsome-looking SUV, I think. And I believe this is going to be made in South in Carolina, is in America, right? Kyle, do you know what yeah, I Yeah, outside of Charleston. Right, but this this is let's first. This crossover. would be basically be the XC90 electric. But didn't we know all of this? Volvo's yeah. been laying out their plan. Yeah, it, it wasn't really Embla, E M B L A, Embla. Right. Um, so is there, so we haven't. I don't think there's like official word, but you know, I think we all believe that it's going to be like the XC90, um, whatever it takes over. You know, I think the XC90 is going away as far as a name, possibly. Yes, it is. Yeah, as far as we know. And then it's going to be replaced by an all electric vehicle and it's going to be made in South Carolina among other places. Yep. Um, yeah. So I don't know if there, I don't have any other information about that, but I just thought I'd throw it out there since we were talking about Polestar and Volvo is Polestar's parent. So, but so Stellantis also had an event where it presented a long term plan called Dare 2030. As a part of that, it revealed a small electric Jeep crossover, smaller than its Renegade. Uh, that will have an all-electric version and launch that launches early next year in uh, 2023. Uh, they didn't really give us anything in the way of details. Uh, we did get some images of the front and the back. And if it's priced right, it, I think it could sell in, in decent numbers. It looks, you know, fine. It looks good enough. Kind of, if you, yeah. But this will be a mild hybrid and a battery electric. So it's going to be a combustion and an electric car. Well, well first it's going to start in production in the gasoline version. And then the all electric version comes out. And then the hybrid version will come out next fall, I believe. It's like a. That is so it's exciting. A, it's, a, it's a weird. I don't even know why they have a. Why didn't they just go hybrid? right from the get go but i i thought i thought electric was coming first being made in poland um but maybe the gas version is coming first you'd know more right but, it's uh, in, it's built in poland on the cmp or the compact modular platform yeah. uh used by citron uh, opel and peugeot so it's not even on the new stla platforms that are coming the small large and medium yeah. or whatever they have for their new, really new new electric drive and uh, since it's a jeep it's going to have all-wheel drive most likely uh interestingly it's going to have catl batteries for the first six months of production and then they're going to switch to byd batteries i don't know what's up with that uh, but hmm. if you don't like this uh there will also be an alfa romeo and fiat version as well the fiat uh, should begin production in may of 2023 and the alpha in october of next year if it gets through its final approvals that's still going through that process so uh, Tom, I think I think this looks pretty great, and it could be a hit if they get the range and the price right. I don't think it's quite your maybe your cup of tea, but uh, do you think it could do as well as Renegade? That did like that's doing like fifty thousand units a year right now, and but they wanted to sell like a hundred thousand or one hundred ten thousand of these a year, which is kind of what Renegade did uh, the first couple of full years of production when it was out. Yeah, I mean these compact crossovers. You go, go to a, any parking lot. There's a million of them out there. So if they, you know, execute properly, yeah, I think it looks cool. Uh, definitely, you know, I, I love that front end. Um, I, I, sure, I don't see why it wouldn't do well. It seems like it's the type of vehicle that people want. Does it drive well? What's the price? You know, we don't know really anything about the all electric version, but uh, seems like if they execute properly, that's 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 a nice little vehicle. I'm kind of curious what the Alfa Romeo will look like, actually. I mean, I, I think this is fine, but like for my like 
personal taste. I think mm, the spicy Italian styling might be kind of nice in a small package like that too. But then every time you drive it, you're going to think, oh, they make a Jeep version of this. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to feel way less special. Yeah. yeah. But but we, we, now they, we do that sell, you know, Fiat's and you can get Fiat's and Alfa Romeo's in the U.S. Uh, I don't know. I, I imagine they would sell. There's only electric. one Fiat model left being sold in the U.S. and it's the 500X. Oh, really? Yeah, you can't even get the 124 anymore. What? I mean, yeah, oh, just the five, there's one Fiat model. There's two Alpha models. That's not great. So they, they kind of need this if they want to keep actually selling vehicles in the U.S. Their dealers are probably not happy. But how could them. you buy it if there's no dealers to even sell them? I mean, they have to have some dealers, right? You have to have some dealers. You have to have a service network. So you're going to have like, is it going to be this and then a really ugly Fiat 500X? Are those, is that going to be enough to support the dealer network? I'm surprised they're alive right now. Yeah, that's true. I mean, but man, it's, it's, it's a, it's, I don't know. It's hard to give up a whole market like North America, give up, give, just give up your market because it's not really working out because you didn't really plan it out well from the get go. I uh, think we could just say that for most of the American Stellantis brands right now, it's not mm. planned out well. Their trucks, their SUVs, perfect on point, you know, great with the messaging, 700 horsepower, supercharged Hellcats and SUVs, America, they get that. They are not understanding EVs, though. Right. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. They have. They have. There's a. Uh, we had an article about from the same uh, event there, 2030, where they were talking about. I think their big electric muscle car is going to make some sort of lightning sounds. Like they're we care. <laughs> we don't care about sounds really <laughs> like we just want the purity of the noise like electric motors sound really oh, yeah. cool yeah when you, when you like if you ever drive a model 3 and like rip all the plastic out or a model s it sounds like a race car in there it's amazing um <laughs> you know you, we just want the uh, for me as a purist i just want the noise that the thing is making yeah yeah i agree uh, okay, so let's move on. Uh, they also, we also saw a little bit of the uh, the new Ram Revolution. I believe that's what they're going to call it. Um, That'll be really cool. Range extender. Uh, yeah, there's a bit of more of a, a look of the because the first images we saw, the teaser images were kind of like a, you know just like a vague outline, and the images well, they're producing. The teaser now, image. They, wait, it was just a Ram logo. Yeah, <laughs> well, there was, there was an outline. Some lights around it. There was a bit of an outline. You could see. So this is still pretty basic sort of outline but you can see like the, the light signature in the front and the big ram lo logo and then from the rear you can see like the, the slope of the roof downward so it's i it's a nod to some amount of aer aerodynamic efficiency <laughs> somewhat it looks like there's a big vent in the hood too as well actually we're looking at yeah like the eye like paces hood yep. vent right yeah uh, or they very creased. It's very sloopy, swopy. Pick and there's no mirrors on this one. Pickup truck owners, I don't know, but I think what makes sense for trucks is the option, and we've heard it sort of thrown around here. The option for a range extender, which means you can do ninety percent of your driving, your work around town, battery electric, and you can still do that, and you can buy a battery electric vehicle, but then have a backup if you need to tow a load or do something. And I think that's the perfect solution for real working trucks in my opinion yeah that could work in this situation i'm not uh you know i'm not uh, automatically opposed to that idea in in this application maybe that's uh, maybe that's a good i think place it's for the it. difference for me at least it would be the difference of being able to buy a primarily electrified vehicle or not because the the, the option down from a full battery electric is like an f-150 power boost there's not even a plug-in hybrid um, so, so you just have a, a regular hybrid vehicle and that's not very electric. So I think the, for, for utility trucks, for RVs, plug-in hybrid, uh, or range extended hybrid, primarily battery electric with a backup, that's the future for real work trucks yeah, we'll until see. we get batteries and charging stations that can handle yeah. big vehicles. Do we know when the Ram revolution is coming? It seems no. like it's, uh, it's going to be way behind. It's not, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. They saw the, what Ford did and said, oh, we should probably do that. The Rivian's <laughs> coming now. Uh, mm. the Hummer Hummer EV pickup truck will be what, probably this fall, I think. And then, uh, Wait, yeah. Hummer EVs on sale. We know people who drive them. But SUVs, right? Not the pickup. Oh, truck. sorry. I Excuse me. Oh, no. How does that go again? Yeah, there's pickup trucks out it's there. A pickup, it's a pickup truck first, then the SUV. Yep. Ah, right. 
So yeah, so that's. Uh, I think they only sold like the one last year, though. I don't know. No, nope. and then Mister Hendrick has his, and there's like three or four out there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I know there's still like a, a drive event coming up for that. Yeah, end event. of this month. Yeah. That's gonna be fun. I'll see you there. <laughs> <laughs> I know nothing about nothing. Um, yeah, and then there's the uh, Chevy Silverado EV, which I think is you know pretty promising with a lot of that same. That's really exciting to me. I think that's gonna be freaking awesome because it can tow quite a bit. It can charge at 350 kilowatts. It'll do this 400, 800 volt chunk thing when you plug in. <laughs> it's gonna be pretty neat. And it's probably not going to be 9,000 pounds like the Hummer version. I don't think it's going to be far off of that. Yeah. I'm oh, hoping for like seven. Maybe. Yeah, it's like... not. It's going to be more than seven. Oh, geez. Okay. Oh, with the big battery, it's got to be. It's going to use, isn't it going to use the same big battery as the Hummer EV? Uh, in, in the big battery version, it will. Yeah. I'm Which sure they'll have a smaller battery version. 200, 200, kilowatt hours. Yeah. 200 240 hour. kilowatt hours gross. Yeah, I heard 235. I heard, I've heard a few different yeah, numbers, but roughly 240 kilowatt hours. That's dude, that's, that's a that's lot of battery. 3,000 pounds right there. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. Yeah, battery battery improve tech can't improve fast enough, really. I mean, this besides besides charging speeds, energy density still has there's still a ways to go yet. Um, so, so Tom, I'm not one to tell you to move on, but let's move on. Let's, uh, <laughs> so we're at an hour and 15 minutes. We yeah. have to talk. Ford and the fact that they're splitting up the company. Right. So, you so Coach, Coach DA just, just is, uh, you're on the like same have, wavelength. He's there already. Coach yeah. DA. Model E will change how they work internally. Uh, I'm not, I guess it was a conversation going about it on already in comments. So, yeah. Um, let's turn that off. And so, where are we at? So, another bit of interesting news this week is that. Ford has divided itself in two, an electric, an electric side and a combustion side. Its electric vehicles will fall under the Model E division, and the combustion vehicles will be under a division called simply Blue. So it also has its pro division for commercial vehicles, and that will include both electric and gas. But so as part of this new arrangement, our friend, uh, our friend Darren Palmer, who is a guest on the show last September, he becomes the VP of electric vehicle programs. So that's pretty cool. Um, but perhaps even more interesting, though, is that uh, Ford Model E will be run by Jim Farley as president, in addition to his role as CEO of Ford Motor Company. So that's putting a high priority on this part of the business. And Doug Field, who used to be with Tesla, of course, he will be uh, Ford Model E uh, chief EV and digital systems officer. And I think Darren Palmer actually re reports to him. I'm not exactly sure, but Tom, yes. so this is kind of a big deal, I guess. I don't know. What do you think of this move? So to me, the biggest deal out of it is that Ford is trying to improve the purchasing uh, experience for electric vehicle, their electric vehicle owners. Um, in, in my opinion, it, this could have been the whole driving force behind splitting the, the company up into these two divisions. Um, because as, as we all know, here in the U.S., um, the, the, there's very strict dealer franchise laws. And the, the OEMs have very little control over what the individual dealerships do. And the legacy brands find themselves at a competitive disadvantage to some of the uh, startups like Tesla and Lucid and Rivian, because the, many people view the, the buying uh, process a lot better when it's streamlined and you can just place an order. There's a set price. There's no haggling. Uh, you can order it on your computer and, you, and, and, and you're done. And now we've seen the talk recently of uh, Ford F-150 Lightning reservation holders being informed by their dealership that uh, they're going to tack on $10,000, $15,000 in some cases on top of the um, MSRP. And Ford's not happy about that. I mean, it's Ford's not the only brand. A lot of brands are experiencing this, particularly today with the uh, shortage of vehicles that the dealerships have. So I really think that part of this whole move could be to isolate their electric vehicles and legally allow Ford to have some sort of a, a, a direct sales um, process that isn't really direct sales. Now, this isn't going to be a direct sale. I know a lot of people, I saw them tweeting about it, making comments online that, you know, it's, it's you know, 
Ford's cutting the dealers out with this with uh, with, with Model E. They're not. They can't. They still legally have to. Every sale has to go through a dealership. But it appears as though Ford is going to allow you to order it online with a locked set in price. So uh, everybody pays the same price. Then they will pass it along to the dealer that you have selected and the dealer will facilitate the rest of the sale. They'll they'll deliver the vehicle to you. They'll, you know, um, if it's a lease, they'll, you know, you'll sign all the documents there. But it seems like the dealer will not have any influence over the price. Now, I know this is going to if that's the case, this is going to be contested. NADA is going to is 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 going to most certainly have an issue with this. And that, that's the dealer association. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah. The, in the U.S. and local state-run dealer associations, um, I know because they have been, uh, you know, vigilantly fighting this direct sales model, and they would see this, in my opinion, as the foot in the door. Yeah. That this is just the beginning of where the traditional brands are going to take the power away from the dealers with regards to price, and you know they are going to. Definitely, in my opinion, they're going to take a hard, long, hard look at this and see if if Ford can legally do it. Hey, Tom, question for you about this current plan, though. So we know, uh, similar to Polestar, this this is going to be the the automaker trying to control as much of the experience as possible, keeping the dealers there just for signing paperwork, not giving them inventory. But I still see a hole where. Let's say you you select the vehicle, it shows up the dealer, you're about to go pick it up. Oh, sorry, I'm canceling. And now the dealer has this vehicle, which they legally can't, uh, they can sell it for whatever they want. Like there, there's no way around this law, right? So I still think we'll see inventory and I still think we'll see markups, but it really depends on how Ford is going to do this. Are they going to buy the car back from the dealer group at that point? I don't know. We'll see. Exactly. There's still, you know, questions on on how this is going to be implemented, but it does seem as though that's the direction Ford is going and that they want to have, um, you know, consistent pricing that they control, that the dealership doesn't have power over. And, um, you know, it's going to be, this is going to be interesting to see how this plays out because the dealer associations are not going to be happy about this. Yeah, but I think we got to come up with a plan here because dealers are not all of them. There are still some amazing dealers out there, but- yeah. They've really, the ones that aren't great are really not great. And they're really coming out of the woods now where people are catching on, especially in the shortage situation about experience, about, um, you know, charging over MSRP for a lot of vehicles. Way and over. Way, yeah, and like egregiously over, like $50,000, $100,000 markups left and right. I keep hearing about every day. Ridiculous. Well, it's, it's free market. You don't yeah. have to buy the car. You know, I, I'm not necessarily against that. You know, I, 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 I know it's it's terrible, but the fact of the matter is these are individual businesses that paid very high franchise fees. And, you know, they nobody complains when a dealer unloads a car for, for five grand less than what they paid for it just yep. to get it the hell off the lot. I mean, I bought a, a Mitsubishi pickup truck back in. 1989, <laughs> it was a leftover 88. And I walked out the door with that vehicle. It was a four-wheel drive Mitsubishi pickup truck for eight grand. The sticker price was like twelve nine or something like that. The, the dealership lost, I think, three thousand dollars. The guy was telling me, but they had like eight of them, and they were just trying to get them off the lot. So was that the D one? Was that the D one? Was that the D one hundred? No, it was just called the pickup. Oh, really? It was okay. a Mitsubishi. It said like pickup. That was it. Or P U. <laughs> The hyphen you pay or something like that i mean it was nice it was uh, i really wanted a toyota um a pickup truck, but i couldn't afford it and uh -huh. so i went to the mitsubishi a lot and i'm like eh, it kind of looks like a toyota i think i, I, I think <laughs> i think this will do just fine and it was like purple it was like this this dark 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 blue almost purpley color and that's why they couldn't get it off the lot it was kind of an ugly color but i was like I, it works for me so yeah, I, drive, I agree, I Tom. You're right. Charge, charge whatever you want. You can go out and find the vehicles elsewhere. But we are just seeing this. This is not the experience that the automakers want the buyer to have. You know, the automaker can do all of their marketing, all of their media, have all of everything, their ducks in a row. And then it's left to someone completely out of their control. And I think it's really showing that it's, it's very much bothering the automakers. I've had countless conversations with them about this, where they can't control the experience. And there's really nothing they can do about it. But Ford is trying, and I commend them for trying. Is this it, Tom? So 
Oh. Yeah, yeah, but that was the two-wheel drive version. <laughs> oh, okay. That and, and that that wasn't the same color. Mine was definitely like a brighter, brighter <laughs> blue. Unless it's just the the, the lighting. But yeah, that's what was, you got it. And I had what, the extra cab too. So that that, that nice. That. That's what I was picturing. But for some reason, I was thinking D100. I like that nice. extra cab. <laughs> So, so coach, coach Da uh, disagrees with you a little bit. Uh, he says it's, it's still for their bigger fight is breaking away from their established internal processes for developing vehicles. Uh, that's what they're trying to change. Um, that was my understanding of it originally was that they're trying to like have this different mindset of working and separating that, right? Yeah, and when we and when we look at Ford, and we've had Darren on the show, someone incredibly senior, but you know, talked about, was very open. And I thought he answered all of our questions, didn't give any politicians answers. And the way he said, you know, where he couldn't say, he's like, I can't say yet, but, you know, I'll tell yeah. you when I can. So I great. found him a ref like really refreshing. Also looking at Ford, who hired, as you say, Doug Field from Apple, but before that was the man behind Model 3. And my goodness me, to get the Model 3 to the market, um, and equally the Model Y, which is a bigger Model 3, so to have him uh, underneath, so you've got Jim Farley, Doug Field, Darren, and then uh, uh, hopefully a mindset of innovation and change. And whilst a CEO or whilst senior people, I don't know about you, whether you've worked in big organizations or not, what I have over the years, despite often nice PowerPoint presentations and a nice company culture, and it's all heading in the right direction, You'll still have an idea or you'll want to do something. You want to innovate or you'll want to buy a slightly different brand of stapler. And there's like four people to tell you, no, you can't. And and hopefully what this move does is it keeps very profitable combustion businesses doing what they're very good at. And we need them to sell those vehicles to fund the EV bit. So they're very good at that. You do what you've always done, but be 2% better every year. That suits those people and that mindset, and it carries on making money. And then the people who want to work in a business where they're challenged and be told you have to be 50% better every year, who like that, almost having that fear, that sort of, you know, not fear, but also having that, that, that level of uncertainty. It's not right for everyone. And I hopefully those people are in that bit of the business. And those are the people that are like, yeah, come on, guys. Let's get the different brand of stapler a whole punch. We can do it. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> that's such big, a great analogy. Big companies are horrible. Big companies, as much as we, you know, you can try and change them. I've worked in a couple, and in every case, the you put more, more, and more layers in, and it, it can be it can be like wading through treacle. And right. you know, long term viewers of this podcast know and this show know that I've said many times. I think Tesla needs more. Of that i think they need a really strong coo someone who sits underneath elon musk that says yes that's good and no that's bad and i think tesla could do with a little bit more of that ford probably need a little bit less of that because they've just grown over the years they've grown into the business that they uh to suit the kind of business that they were but selling evs is very very different from the level of innovation you need to the kind of mindset to the dealers um to how people want to buy cars um, and and have them fixed when things go wrong because all machines will go wrong. Hopefully, a little bit less than the oily bits. So I this to me again. I didn't read anything in this news that seemed like a red flag or, you know, it wasn't GM getting married to Nikola. And uh, you know, when you, when you like when you read some of the headlines that big automakers do, you're like, are you okay? Are you on the mimosas early again today? Because <laughs> like twice if you're being held hostage. Right. <laughs> Whereas all of this seems sensible and good, and that can be quite strange as well. When you know big established companies that have been around hundred plus years just do, you, you read it and you think well, that, that all makes sense. That's very sensible. So hopefully, so you know, it our, works. Our friends at Maki Vlog uh, say that Model E encompasses a lot from EV development to software OTAs to customer experience. So I have to admit myself, I didn't dive deep into this, you know, because I saw oh, it's, mm, it's, it reminds me of like they did a Team Edison a few years back. And, you know, I don't know if, if that really changed a lot of things, maybe internally, you know, it didn't seem to reflect a lot from the outside, you know, inside, mm -hmm. outside looking in. But I didn't really delve in the details, so I'm glad y'all <laughs> have uh, paid attention. <laughs> I have I have a lot not, of other stuff going on. So it's not like they haven't been doing that all along. 
You know, right. I mean, it, they're just putting it under a new roof now. And, and, and uh, you know, um, I, I wasn't implying before that that's the only reason why they did this. I, uh, what I was saying was it would surprise me if one of the impetuses to, to doing this was like, how do we move forward with uh, the electric vehicle division and figure out a way to do set pricing because people want that. And the way to do it is to create a whole new division. It would have to be separated from their gas cars. They could never get away with it with the dealer franchise laws if it was just Ford. So, um, you know, and, 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 and then if they're going to do that, of course, you're going to take everything and put it under its own umbrella and, you know, just really separate the two divisions. I, I wasn't implying that that was the only reason why they did that. There are clear advantages to having a whole division that is just singularly focused on electric vehicles. And I mean, I think it's a good move for Ford. Right on. Well, we're almost up against it. Uh, our hundredth show. There was also, there's another bit of news. Oh, I think I've had too much champagne. Uh, there's another <laughs> bit. <laughs> You've had like a half a sip. What are you talking Not about? Enough. No, I mean, I'm on my second glass. Now oh, it gets good. interesting. Right. Yeah. Let's go for the next hour and a half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there was some, uh, Hyundai and Kia also held a big, you know, product long, mid to long term, uh, uh, events talking about what they're doing. Uh, the Hyundai one was the 2022 CEO Investor Day, and where they, you know, gave uh, a little bit of a product plan of what they're planning to do in the future. Uh, their expected sales—they want to do like 840,000 EV units in 2026, and uh, 1.87 million units in 2030. Uh, and Seems 21, yeah, hard, except that doesn't include Kia. This is oh uh, yeah, good shot. This it's is it's Hyundai and Genesis. Hyundai and Genesis only. Yeah, so oh, I was yeah, that GV70 picture makes it look really good compared to the gv60 yeah that gv70 does look good yeah, actually that I thing looks that. awesome <laughs> oh i think the, the big bit of, i think the big bit of news from the sunday thing apart from the seven new cars or the does it the 12 new ones and the seven funday is, is confirmation that ionic six at the timeline of that which is q3 um uh because that looks really interesting because bjorn newland in norway came across one in camouflage outside the hotel he was staying in he was doing some uh, some Arctic Circle stuff a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and he came across one. So of course, spent like twenty minutes walking around it, and I think that's going to be a really interesting vehicle, Arctic Six. And that's a sedan that had an awesome looking yeah. concept of vehicle originally. Yeah, and it looks re it look the proportions look great. If the price is good, built on that platform, will charge really fast. I think it could be a really attractive car. Yes, it's not an SUV crossover, so rules out a lot of that market, but I'm, I'm less interested in those vehicles anyway. Right. I, I think there's always this possibility that the sedan market might you know, make a bit of a comeback anyway. Nope. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm wrong. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> so, um, yeah, any, uh, there's, yeah, there's a bunch of other news in that. We have a couple of stories up on the EV, uh, Inside EVs. That's who, who I work for. Um, <laughs> from with the keep drinking, uh, keep drinking. With, the, with the Hyundai plan and the Kia plan, there's two different articles on that. Uh, um, they talk about uh, the amount of batteries they plan on uh, making by 2030, and also the mix. So they're going to do LFP batteries as well as the NCM, the nickel cobalt manganese batteries. Yeah, so that's all I have. <laughs> there you go. And I got to go drag racing. What's that? We're going to go drag racing now. All right. Hey, actually, yes. so this is our 100th show. Oh, are we going to get treated finally? It took 100 so, shows so to get you, the guitar out. So you all have been looking at this thing in the background for, I don't know if you can, can you hear that? Yes. So you've been hearing that for a while. So I thought I'd just X, 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 X. Extro, outro the show with uh, yeah. uh, with a song. Actually, I'll, I think I'll do one on my own. Um, so if you have any comments or questions, you can leave them on the Inside EVs Forum podcast thread or on our YouTube or Twitch comment sections. If you like the show, please give us a thumbs up. If you're watching us on YouTube, uh, don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Follow Tom at Tom Malogny or follow, follow Tom Malogny at Tom Malog. That's with two M's. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, <laughs> Martin Lee is at EV News Daily. Kyle Connor is at it's Kyle Connor. And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all again next week. Well, 
I'm in a cottage and you're in a castle, the difference between us. You could fill up a canyon the size of the Grand One, but what does it matter? If when you look in my eyes you can see what really lies there. It makes all the difference, the shoes on my feet, the shirts that I wear. When I close my eyes, well, I can see your smile. I can feel my heart beat racing. You're an addiction without contradiction, a habit worth having. A flash of your smile can erase all denial my heart harbors. A flash of your smile can make a day spent in hell seem worthwhile. For a glimpse of those lips that I long to kiss, I would crawl miles when I close my eyes, well, I can see your smile, I can feel my heart beat racing. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all very much for 100 episodes of sticking with us, even despite of this. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you all again next week and hopefully for another 100 episodes.